On today's Ask Dr. Bitcoin, we're going to talk about decentralized exchanges, centralized exchanges, and then how to use them. Stay tuned. Well, hello there. I'm Mark Risen Hopkins. I'm a blockchain and cryptocurrency enthusiast who's been in studying and learning about the space since 2011. And today we're going to talk about a couple of topics that all kind of revolve around the idea of cryptocurrency exchanges or the places where you take one form of currency and turn it into another. You can break it down a number of different ways, but uh, the way I find most helpful is to break it down to centralized and decentralized exchanges. We'll talk about what that means, and then I'll show you how to use a couple of decentralized exchanges later on in the program. Stay tuned. A cryptocurrency exchange is a place for you to take your money and turn it into other types of money. Uh, most commonly, uh, you're probably gonna be taking USD and turning it into Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin or something like that. But there are exchanges all over the internet that uh, will allow you to transfer it into either a small array of cryptocurrencies like GDAX will allow you to do Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, Ethereum. And there's at the other end of the spectrum uh, or exchanges like Binance it will give you thousands of key pairs. Uh, you can transfer your Litecoin into IOTA, your IOTA into Ethereum, and all, all the other little stops in between. So those are kind of the extreme you know, examples, one end to another, in terms of the variety and the, the, the amount of transaction, uh, transaction types you can do on an exchange. Uh, like I said at the top of the program, though, I'm going to break it down into a two different types of categories because if we've been doing our homework and watching the show so far, you know that cryptocurrency and blockchain is a technology that is all about decentralization. And one of the last bastions in this space where things haven't quite evenly decentralized is the exchange space. I'm going to draw, uh, if you've been watching the program, kind of a familiar graphic where I if we talked about SegWit. This was kind of that little diagram that we use to kind of show what the blockchain works like and how uh, transactions take place. This was Matthew over here and this is Andrew over here. And as we said in that program, a lot of the way Bitcoin is described as a peer-to-peer -peer transaction where if Matthew wants to send Andy a Bitcoin, he just sends him a Bitcoin. But of course, that's not exactly how it works because both Matthew and Andy have direct connections to the blockchain itself. And so doing, Matthew, if he's sending Andy a Bitcoin, is really just updating a ledger entry on the Bitcoin network, which then Andy reads and discovers that now he has provenance of the value that Matthew sent him. Exchanges, in the, in the centralized sense, work exactly the same way. So instead of Matthew sending a Bitcoin to Andy, he is sending it to MT Gox or Bitfinex or any of the other, or Binance, or any of the other hundreds of, of uh, exchanges out there. And then if he wants to take that Bitcoin and turn it into Ethereum, what happens is inside this wallet are wallets for all kinds of things, Ethereum and IOTA and uh, Litecoin and Bitcoin. And so this all happens within the constructs of a centralized piece of software. The exchange happens there. And then on the, the blockchain that Matthew has access to, let's say he's taking that Bitcoin and turning it into an Ethereum. He sends it to the blockchain, reads into the, the, the Bitfinex ledger system. He does the exchange between Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then that Ethereum is then output to the Ethereum blockchain, which Matthew then reads. That is centralized exchanges. That is exactly what uh, is the enemy of, uh, of, of really kind of, uh, of what uh, everything that blockchain stands for. What is the pitfall here? Really what you've created with a centralized exchange is a central point of failure. With a central point of failure, you have a giant honeypot for hackers to come in and go, okay, you've got how much are you doing in daily volume a day? Uh, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of, of, of dollars worth of transactions. I want that. And hackers have a great incentive to go in and penetrate the security of this exchange and take all the money. In the context of a decentralized exchange, you're doing uh, a, essentially a transaction with yourself. See here, Matthew is wanting to turn his Bitcoin into Ethereum in the same example. And he's using a decentralized exchange like Shapeshift or Changely. What these typically are, are a series of smart contracts, either written on top of Ethereum or written on top of another platform that allows for decentralized smart contracts. And 
they act as matchmakers, or they act, or sometimes they'll act as as uh, as brokerages, uh, depending on how they're configured. So Matthew will give uh, an exchange uh, a recipient address that he owns. So he's going to give his Ethereum address over here. He's going to give, he's going to send from his Bitcoin address, and then he sends it into a smart contract owned by Shapeshift or Changely or one of the other decentralized systems that uh, is acting as a matchmaker for some other person coming the other way. So let's say Andy is doing the exact opposite. He's taking some amount of Bitcoin, or he's taking some amount of Ethereum, and he's transferring it to, uh, transferring it to, to Bitcoin. He is coming in this way. Matthew is coming in this way. And in so doing, they have uh, been match made by a series of smart contracts. The difference being here is that the value is transient. It doesn't stay locked up in a wallet that's a giant honeypot. It's there for the duration of the matchmaking in escrow. And if the match is not made for whatever reason, transactions get sent back to the originating wallet address. It's a lot safer for the, the user and it's a lot uh, safer for the ecosystem because there's not a giant honeypot for hackers to try to penetrate. So we talked a little bit about the benefits of a decentralized exchange. Let's talk about how to use one. So I have uh, with me here, uh, I've got one of our Wilco wallets, which is our pre-configured uh, wallet that we make here at the company. And then I've also got over here, my mobile phone that we're going to use. Now what I'm gonna sh uh, demonstrate for you here is how to uh, use the standalone application for uh, Shapeshift as a way to uh, quickly move money from, we're gonna use Dash to Ether because they both have pretty quick block resolution times. It won't be a long demonstration. Here, as you can see on the screen, this is what pops up uh, on the Wilco wallet. It pops up the first time you load up the app. You've got a drop down list of source currencies. There's, there's quite a few here. And then you've got a, see all these ones that are grayed out are ones where there's not enough liquidity or there's not enough people using it to have a match made, but they have the functionality basically built in. Uh, and then over here you have the recipient uh, addresses, or, or sorry, the recipient cryptocurrencies. So uh, what we've already done is we pre-selected Dash, we pre-selected Ether, and then I pre-filled this in with my return address. It's important that you throw that in there, not just because it's required, but in case the transaction fails to go through, you want to have an address where your cryptocurrency will be returned to your control as opposed to just disappear uh, when a transaction fails. Now, if you know a specific amount that you want, rather than just uh, kind of uh, whatever, you're going to be a market taker, you can pre-fill in an optional amount here. I'm going to send 0.1 dash and I'm going to convert that to Ether. You see right there, it says it's calculating a custom rate. And now I need to give it a address to send the resulting ether. What that does is that tells the smart contract to initiate exactly when it receives 0.1 dash, as opposed to waiting for a timeout period and it just converts everything that gets sent to it during the period of time between uh, smart contract initiation and the timeout. So on my phone, I'm going to lo load up, uh, where is it, Coyomi. and I'm going to display my recipient address. It has a nice little scan QR function here. We're going to allow the Wilco wallet access to the camera and then we'll scan that QR code. So we scan the QR code and the address pops right into that blank right there and we hit shift. So it'll start the shift and in just a moment, we'll be able to monitor the progress of the smart contract. As you can see, we've got a giant QR code and it says awaiting deposit. So what did we say we were going to shift? We we're gonna shift 0.1 dash into whatever the equivalent amount of Ethereum is. So we pick up the, uh, the wallet here, turn on our QR code scanner and send button, hit confirm and it should be sent. And so, yeah, hit the network. So what will happen next is you will see the word uh, awaiting deposit turn green. 
The word exchange will turn yellow as it's in a pending state while it's in the matchmaking mode. And then finally, once it all resolves and it has sent it back to us, it will turn green on the complete side and the transaction will be done. So as you see, it, uh, it now has registered it as being sent. If you look on my phone, it now shows one confirmation. One confirmation showed it sh as being received. It just flipped over to be the exchange has been complete. So let's flip over to the Ethereum address over here and it shows zero confirmations, but it has it. Okay, one confirmation. Now, uh, so the entire exchange took uh, less than, I don't know, maybe run a timer on that, but it was like about 30 seconds, 45 seconds or so. Not too shabby. Because it's decentralized, because Shapeshift and Changely are decentralized, you can actually run them inside of other programs. They're APIs that you can access from the web. You can access from this native application, or you can go inside of commonly used cryptocurrency wallets like Coinomi and, and, uh, and Jax. And if you see over here in the upper left hand corner, the exchanges are actually built into the wallet. So let's go ahead and try Changely, which is exactly like Shapeshift, except that it has a, a different basket of currencies that it works with. So um, the only ones that will be a, a available to, to use on the, the left hand side are the ones that you actually have set up within your wallet. But if you look over on the right hand side, you've got a much wider array uh, of things available to you. Again, things that are set up already, but you're also able to use a, a pretty wide variety of uh, ERC-20 tokens with some of these as well. So let's go ahead and send ourselves 0.1 dash. And I, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm really feeling Ethereum today. So we're going to send ourselves that back in Ethereum. As I described in the diagram, it's going out and doing some matchmaking. It wants me to confirm right here. I hit send. We can actually watch the whole process take place. It's waiting for the deposit into that address. And it already, I don't have to do any, because it's native to the application, I don't have to fill out all these forms. It knows what the return address is. It knows what the destination address is. It's gonna generate all that and pre-fill it into the API. And then we just get to watch the whole exchange process take place on its own. In fact, you don't even have to wait like we have to watch the transaction go through. You can back out of it and it will uh, take place in the background but you can always go back and check your previous transactions within Shapeshift by clicking over here on your exchange history and it'll tell you the status of whatever that is right there. Shapeshift and Changely both have websites where you can log in and ex uh, use your wallet, scan some QR codes or type or copy and paste your, your, your uh, cryptocurrency addresses and just the same way we did with a standalone application. It's a very easy system to use and uh, again, it's, it's a step forward for the, for the, for the whole space in terms of taking things away from honeypots into a, a decentralized utility and towards the eventual future of headless and decentralized where there is no corporation or no face of it at all. It's just a series, it's a feature of the cryptocurrency itself. So there's really effectively no difference between using the website, the app, or the in, internal uh, interface inside of a cryptocurrency wallet. You're talking about using the same set of smart contracts behind the scenes, and the only thing different is the UX on top of that. So you can effectively count on it being just as secure no matter which way you're accessing it. <laughs>